Okay, so good morning or good afternoon, whenever you're watching this. We will give, same as always, just a couple of minutes for people to join live. But until then, I'm going to stay here and stay nice and toasty next to this fire. Okay, so we'll leave that burning for now. I'm nice and toasty. Um, so, we'll go over. Good morning, everybody. So, I'm Freya. I'm Toby. You've very kindly come to join us. We're hoping that we've got the Range of Arms set up. Uh, down in Burton. We're at Hollybush, where me and Alex are based. Herzl, and we've recruited um, Toby for his expertise in recruiting. Yeah, come and help us out. I've given a clue, haven't I? We're doing, <laughs> we're doing fruit fruit pruning today. So, specifically, we're doing apples and pears, which is what you do at this time of year. We're not, do we might do a tiny bit on some soft fruits and currant pruning just because we need to do some over here. So, if you're thinking, but I need to know about currants got a treat for you but if you're thinking <laughs> Alex laughing at me would be ridiculous <laughs> but yeah we're talking it through a lot of people think you need to do apples and pears a bit earlier on but you don't like now in the coming up coming weeks is the perfect time to be doing apple and pear tree pruning which we'll talk through a little bit so yeah should we start I mean we could start with that like why you do it now yeah. So just really quick before we get into it, if you've got any comments or any questions or anything, shoot them uh, our way in the chat because I am behind the camera um, and I'll do my best to try and answer. And we've got Hazel as well on the other side. Yeah. Hazel is tech support. Alex is cameraman. It's like a proper film crew. <laughs> yeah. So please do ask questions. Alex answers as we go. If you're not watching this live, because this will be staying online, it'll be on YouTube, and it'll be on Skeleton and on Facebook pages. So if you're not watching it back, if you're watching it after the time, you can still comment, and the, we'll still get notifications that we'll try and answer your comments. That. Or if you can't answer it live, we'll research it later and get back to you. Um, so yeah. it's worth saying, when Freya said, best time you do it is now, now is Beginning of March. You're watching it in a few months' time. <laughs> beginning of March, February March, right? Yeah, so that, you do it in winter, but you don't do it in midwinter. So you want to do it when the tree is dormant, but there's not the risk of a hard frost. Because if you've just cut it, it's called a wound when you cut a tree, when you do the pruning cut. And if it, there's then a hard frost, then that open wound is really susceptible to it. It's, it's wet, it, the frost gets in, it can damage the tree, it can damage the cut, it makes it harder for it to heal. So you want to do tree dormant, so you're not doing it damage when it's trying to grow, 
but also when it's not going to do more damage from the cold. And if you do it at the start of winter, which a lot of people do, and I would do some, so I did do some on my apple tree, anything that's going to get more damaged over winter. So we'll talk a little bit more about this now, later, sorry. But you could do some cuts, but the main pruning, you want to leave it to the end of winter because then before the sap rises is what it's called, before the sap rises in the tree, where it starts to come into the green, it starts to produce leaves. But the end of winter means that it's still dormant, but it's about to start coming to life again. So it's about to heal. So it means it's the shortest time available for it to have an open wound. So come spring, it will all start healing over. It'll start rejuvenating itself. And that wound won't be open. And it's less likely to get frost in it. It's less likely to get infection in it over the winter months. Um, so that's kind of why you do it now. And um, you can do it surprisingly late. When the buds are starting to form, there's little green buds, you can still do the pruning. It's when the buds start to open and the leaves are fully coming out, that's when you don't do it. You don't prune then. The one thing about doing it this time of year, so we're in March now, which means that cutting anything back that's got an active bird's nest in is actually illegal. Like, you cannot cut anything that's got a bird's nest. So by doing it at this time of year, especially if you've got a tangly tree just make sure you've been really careful just to check there's no bird nesting activity in your tree because you, if there is you just can't prune it then so that is a danger of leaving the site so the very end of february you kind of get away with that problem but doing it now and especially if you've got an open tree like we can see there's no birds nesting in them we can check that and I'd be very surprised if a bird did nest in there. But do does that is something to be cautious of. I think it's something the trees we're doing today we can look at and know it's to do that no bird nesting in because they're quite cold. Whereas obviously if some apple trees are not quite big as yeah. then you might want to plant a little bit. Yeah. So the apple tree that I've got on my lot is quite big and it's quite dense. So I did actually go through and I did check. I there's there was a bird's nest from last year, I checked all it had was dead baby chicken in it. Like, there was nothing from this year. It was delightful. But... <laughs> um, Freya, we talked about why we might prune now, but is it worth saying why would you prune your apple trees at all? That is true. Why wouldn't you just leave them right. Do you want to answer that question yeah, yourself? Yeah, I can do a little bit. I've so, talked enough. I guess there's a few reasons. <laughs> um, here, we, this is some of the trees we're going to be pruning today. And these are quite small, but they will get bigger. And so one of the reasons you might be pruning them would be a practical reason to manage it from the past. We're also going to prune these initially to form their shape in the end. If we don't make cuts on them while they're small, they won't grow into the shape that we want them to end up being. Uh, the natural form of this apple tree here has already been changed. You see there's a cut been made there, and it would have grown straight up and had lots yeah. of bits coming off the side. It's and a bit like, this, is, yeah. like the bottom section is, a bit carrying on up. And that branch that grows straight up, that's got the straight pin like branch that goes up the middle, that's called the leader. So if we talk about the leader, that's what we're talking about, the one that runs straight up the middle. And yeah, if you ever read about that, if you read about how to prove that's what we're doing. Uh, this it, is a dwarfing root, I think it's then 26. So that's another thing you might hear about reading about apple tree, is it might have these weird not letter number combinations. I was talking about dwarfing root star or semi-dwarfing rootstock, or M26, M6, sound like motorways. They're actually the name of the rootstock, so that's been put on it. So, Alex, do you see this mm. bit just down here? Nearly all cultivated apples aren't grown on their own roots. So the, a branch of one tree, or a, of a known variety, a cultivar, has been grafted onto the root at this point here of another tree. And so then, the root will determine how big the tree grows and the the scion, the grafted, the the, uh, the branch which has been grafted on will determine the kind of fruit that we get. So as Freya was saying, this is a dwarfing variety, so it won't grow very big. So we want to manage it, the expectation that it's going to be a small bush, basically, rather than yeah. And a lot of the apple trees you get into your garden, so there are a lot of the ones Garden, or if you're thinking about getting one and putting it in your garden, the sort of side garden most people have, you want to probably go for a dwarfing or semi dwarfing variety. And they will say that in the garden centre. If you ask them, they'll know about that. That's why a standard 
way of talking about it. And you probably only want one that's going to get so big. Because it's a lot easier to pick the fruit. It doesn't shade out your house. They're just a much more manageable size, aren't they? And prayer is the plan for this one just to be growing kind of all around, like if you cover this space. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to, we should say, yeah, we're talking about standard sort of wine glass shaped apple tree pruning where you do get sort of a spally age, you get loads of fancy shapes you can do with formative pruning. We're just doing a standard goblet shape is what we're aiming for. Um, if you want to so look up the spally age things and the sort of the things you can do with apple trees, it's really cool, but we're just going to go with the basics. So shall we talk about the tools we're going to use and then come back and talk about yeah. the plan for this one? So, probably not going to use both of them. We do have this, so if you're doing any bigger branches, so anything that's sort of thicker than your wrist, then you want to use sort of a bow saw, a bigger saw like this. You just want to make sure that the blade is sharp and that the blade is tight. It should be under tension. So you can adjust that at the end. That's the bow saw. Oh, I will say, you should wear gloves. I'm wearing gloves today. I wasn't wearing gloves at the weekend. I've cut my hand open, which is an exact example of why <laughs> it is important. It's so easy to just slip and just cut your hand. Probably shouldn't have admitted to that, did I? Should have just worn the glove and no one would have known that I'm daft. So yeah, that's the bow saw. That's for the thicker cuts. Yeah, anything thicker than your wrist. The next is the pruning saw. So this is a silky folding pruning saw. You get lots of different varieties of that. You kind of get ones that, yeah, this one folds away, which makes it quite easy to put in your pocket, carry safely. You also get ones that come in sheath, so they stay out like this. You can pop them in sheath. It's got sharp little blade, and any cuts that you're doing that are thinner than your wrist or thinner, you'd use a pruning saw. Or... I would say sometimes with fruit trees, it's important to get a cut that's really clean. So if you're doing something that's a little bit thicker, but it's in a really awkward position, you can't get the bow saw in. I would use the pruning saw because it's much more important to get the clean cut that's not going to damage the tree's health. So whereas if I was doing normal tree work, I'd use the bigger saw for all bigger branches on an apple tree. I'd deviate from that a little bit. Um, We've then got these, which are my, these are actually mine, um, my secateurs, the, they are bypass secateurs. So that means that they sort of, they cross over themselves. So you can see they sort of go past each other and you get um, anvil ones. Are there any? We should have picked out the anvil ones. So anvil ones are one where they're sort of a plate and the blade comes down like that and it hits the plate and that's how they cut. And then the anvil one basically does this. And what that means is it goes past there and it makes a cleaner cut. It goes all the way through. It doesn't leave any sort of tassely stray bits of, of the green wood of the branch. You want to make sure they were clean. You want to make sure they were sharp. You want to make sure that, yeah. It's worth having you. It's worth saving your best setters for doing this job, and like really taking care of them. And they're for doing like the thinner branches. You don't want to go in through anything that's not sort of witty. Any hardwood you want to move on to the next tool, which is our loppers. I'll let you talk about the loppers. Okay. Um, so the loppers, yeah, the next side up, somewhere between the saw and the uh, secateurs. Um, Similar process for chopping through, but again, we just want to make sure they're in good condition. They're going to leave a nice clean cut. We don't want to be having to really twist or tear at all or anything. So we want to make sure that we're looking after the tree as well as we can. Those are actually telescopic ones, which can be quite useful if you're doing pruning, because you can then you can get them in quite high up branches. The first trees we're doing very small, but the next ones are a bit bigger, so useful to know. Yeah. Um, yeah, and another pair here, again for powerful cuts um, through, these are nice short handles, so easy to manage. Quite easy for getting into like small spaces. And then if we have anything really high up, we have a pole saw here as well, um, and a patch with, with some pole loppers that goes on to the end of here, so these 
I feel like I would need one wide to show you, but there's a blade there that cuts the same way as a pair of lockers. Or high so it's, you, you do want to be working from ground level when you're doing an apple tree. Fun as it is to climb trees. Like, yeah. You want to be doing it from ground level, so you're better off getting the sort of prop tools and doing it from the ground. So should we make a start? Yeah. And, uh, Freya talked about forming a, a wine glass or a goblet. And so the aim for this one is to end up with um, like a stem and then branches coming out like that, like the sides of a wine glass, hopefully with space in the middle, so that the air can circulate and there's less chance to see a nice branch structure, probably a three or four or five branches coming out in different directions that will form the shape of the tree. And that sh- scaffold branches. Though. Yeah, and that, that shape will kind of remain for the whole of the tree's life. Like the, the cuts we make now will potentially form the kind of structure of the tree. And if we get this right, then we'll, it'll be much easier to manage going forward. Um, so, what, what do you think we'll... So, yeah, we did talk about this. We were sort of talking about this a bit before the live stream. It is something... There's always more than one option when it comes to tree pruning. It's not... I, I love it. It's like a sort of logic puzzle. I, I really like sort of trying to unpick it and figure out what's what's going to happen you kind of you, it's one of those really hopeful things about gardening because you kind of you're pruning it now but you're also going to prune it every year and each step you do is just one step in the journey of it and as toby said those scaffolding branches that you form that are going to be the ones coming outside that's going to be the tree structure forever i mean you can change it gradually over time but you're kind of looking at what this tree might be like in 30 years time but you're also looking about what it would be like next year. One thing is that you don't really want to take out more than 30% of the tree in any one year, unless there's something badly going wrong. So I'll talk about that a bit later. But for the most part, you don't, yeah, you don't go over like 30% of the tree, which means quite often it can be really tempting. You know which branch you're going to want to take out, but you've got to take it at this steady pace where it's like, well, then, I know I need to take that out, but that can be a next year's plan, plan for the year after, and it sort of runs down the line like that. So we were looking at this. So if you want to come in, Alex. So we've got this cut we looked at at the start, which is we did this last year. That's where there was the leader coming up here. We've taken that out, but we now, we want to take, I mean, this whole section out is what we're going to want to do because we're wanting to form this sort of scaffolding structure down here but we don't need to do that this year what we're going to do because if we took all of that and come i don't know how well you can see the branch of the tree we've got these little ones but these are the two big branches at the moment um so if we took both of these out that would i think that would be probably over 30 percent like it's kind of it's on the border it probably could yeah. be done but we were both unsure about we weren't completely sure whether we would do them both at once yeah so one option is to take one and then do the other so yeah so we've decided we're gonna take this one out do you want to do the cut because i've got him okay So we're going to cut through this one. Um, aiming to cut at a slight angle. So you want it to be at an angle so the water can run off it. If you've got something that's a flat top, then the water will pool in it and that will make it less likely to heal. So you've got that slight angle, the water can run off. Another thing with it is that you want it to be as small a wound as possible. So if you do it sort of as close to, so we're saying that the angle, so the angle is from vertical, it wants to be an angle to make water run off, but then there's also the angle that there is, can you pass me the branch? So there's the angle that there is from the branch, so the branch could be in any direction, so this has nothing to do with vertical, but you want it to be as close to 90 degrees from the branch as works with the 
letting water run off because what that means is this is as close to a circle as you can get it so by that being as close to a circle as you can get it which is different to a lot of other tree pruning you do with fruit tree fruit tree pruning you make it as round a circle as possible and that round circle means that the wound so the cut it's called a wound is as small it will heal as quickly as possible like think about a big graze on your knee a big graze takes longer to heal than a little graze so yeah you want it to be so here i've kind of balanced just, having a slight angle to get the smallest wound possible would have been horizontal but that didn't seem like the best solution to the water pool on it so i've got a slight angle on it but not very much yeah and you also you want to make sure there's kind of you want a little bit sticking out because that gives space it's more visible on this front. You can kind of see there's sort of the protruding bark that comes off the main stem. So you want it to you want to leave that because when you do the cut, that is what will heal. So that will then sort of grow round the branch. But you don't want to leave loads protruding because if that's protruding, then so if you cut this here, if you cut it here, oh, it's really hard to. A, yeah, let me get a pointy stick. So if you did it here, then that bark would cut, you'd cut that bark off and it would be much harder. That sort of vigorous growth from the bark would be chopped off and it would make it harder for it to peel over. But if you cut it here, then it would be too far for that bark to grow around. And also if it was cut there, the tree would continue to put all of its energy into trying to keep this little nub alive. So it wouldn't actually even be trying to heal it over. And then gradually that would just die off and then that would start to rot and then it would send the rot back into the main stem. So you want to make sure that you're kind of doing the cut. Uh, not too little, not too much. It's kind of a Goldilocks yeah. scenario. And that, that positioning is quite important. We'll have a look at somewhere that's gone wrong later as an example of why. Like, it's important. Yeah, I could have cut this a millimetre or two lower and I could actually go again. I think it's okay as it is, it's not too proud and what will happen is over time the tree will grow over that and it'll form a collar and then eventually seal over it completely. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and that, like, yeah, it is, it is quite an important thing. And one thing as well, it's always easier to take off, you can take it off but you can't put it back on. So taking off a bit and then sort of getting in better and doing a cleaner cut. Some people say that you should start at the bottom of the tree and then work out because then you're not doing the, like double cutting. But I usually try and start at the outside and then I sort of take off what I need to take off there. And then I might take more of the same branch, but it's less likely to go wrong. It's less likely to fall and tear if you're working with a lighter branch. And you're then more likely to see what things you need to take off and not take off more than you need to and not take off things that you actually don't want to. The other thing I tend to do is to leave everything I'm taking off in a pile at the bottom. But here we're not actually going to take many off this trip, but to have that idea of 30% yeah. and to be thinking, well, what's on the ground should be no more than half of what's left on the tree. So if there was 60% here, 66% here and 33% on the ground, that would be our maximum. So if there's twice as much on the tree as there is on the ground, you're okay. If you're getting to the point where there's any less than twice as much on the tree, you're taking off too much. And the danger of that is you can get what's called over pruning, and then the tree will put out lots of very small shoots of water shoots, um, which then become very hard to manage. You lose your structure, you end up with lots of small, small shoots, and it, it's not great for the, the ongoing uh, maintenance of the tree. It can be sorted out over time, but it's better to avoid going that way in the first place. Okay. Which I kind of anticipated getting with my after tree next year because it had some disease and some bad cuts and some problems. So I had to take I've had to take out quite a lot. So I kind of anticipated that happening <laughs> to me next year. So what else should we do on this one, Craig? Yeah, so we're gonna have a look at we've got these. So we're talking about these aren't really water shoots, but this is the vigorous growth that has come out where we've done pruning last year. So this is actually all one year's growth. So all of these are, these are, you can. All the way here. Oh, right here. Yeah. yeah. And that one. 
from yeah. there, from that collar there, by my finger, all of that. Yeah, you kind of get these collars which show you each year's growth. So there's sort of one there. I think there's actually one there. So maybe we can pop back there. And then it comes right down to there. So that's another year's growth. So that's a year. That was a year, but I think that's been pruned. And then this is a year. So you can kind of see the same growth. So what we're going to then do to this year's growth, or last year now, is sort of prune it and train it to keep going out into the space that we want it to go into. So you can, I don't know if you can see, I'll let Alex get in. There's these buds coming up here and that's sort of the, yeah, leaf, the leaf buds or where there'll be growth coming out of them. But you can, that's the point that you can kind of encourage them to grow. And you, I don't know if you can see, there's sort of one on this side, 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 one on this side. So that will send something that way, that will send something that way, that will send something that way, that will send something this way. When you're pruning them, you use that direction that that bud is pointing to decide which way that branch will go. So let's find one that we, this branch here, we're talking about wanting to get this wine glass, this goblet shape. So we're going to want this one to come out a little bit further this way, which means we run our way up this year's growth. And we find a bud that's kind of pointing yeah, into this gap here. So you don't want one like this one that's going to come this way and it's going to then go into this branch. And you don't want one that's going to go this one here because that will go right back into the middle of the tree. So that's what we're trying to keep clear. So this bud here is on this side. It's pointing this way. You want to get your secateurs and again you don't want to do it up here where it's then going to leave this stick here that's then going to die back you want to go right down to the bud and just uh not damaging the bud just knit behind there and what that will do is actually what's happened on this one that will send the growth out here so you can see we did this last year we cut it here and it sent this these two new growths coming from that point and it sent them out that way okay actually we can I... influence that point that shape where if these ones in the middle are quite vertical, that we can encourage them to go out. Now, we, we know that eventually we probably want to take this one off, and it might be that in the future we take off these central ones mm -hmm. and end up using these outside structure, but we're still planning for it by sending it off to the outside. Because it, then it just keeps that symmetry, it keeps that balance, because even though you'll lose them, if they're kind of coming out this way, it'll skew the whole structure of the tree so you always want to work making it a symmetrical shape so yeah it does and you just go around and just sort of take the ends off all of these and from a bud going so i want that one to come that one i probably want that one to sort of go out that do i maybe actually i might do that that way because i want to go slightly that way mm. Mm. Finding one that goes the way you want it to. That one actually, possibly that one at the end. So that one's sort of just going slightly that way, so it won't interfere with this one. Can I ask what we can do here, Freya, when this one's coming across? I think I think I'd I'd be tempted to take that whole one out. Yeah, I was wondering that actually. I I was wondering about taking out either this one or this one. Yeah. Or possibly even both. Yeah, because we've got that one coming out from that point. We've got... That one is sort of... I mean, it's going back into itself, isn't it? It's not... It's directly above that one. This is where it's all about... There, there's not an exact right and wrong. There's wrong ways of doing it, and there's right ways of doing it, but there's multiple right ways that you can do it. So, yeah. I don't know. I think I'd probably just take that one out. I'd yeah. always go cautiously. So again, taking that down to the base. This one's thin enough that I can use the secateurs on it. Just about. There we go. Try to make a clean cut. Slight slope. As round as possible. And that's just opened it up. So you, in the full size tree, you want it to be... You want it open enough that a pigeon can go through it in full flight. Is the... <laughs> Is what I'm, that's a saying of how wide to open up a tree. So it wants to be wide, it wants airflow to be able to get through. 
but it also wants light, sunlight, to be able to get through it. Because otherwise, you just end up with sunlight hitting the front, the south side of the tree, and the ones on the north side the never ripen properly. So the air coming through it, the light getting through it, the yeah pigeons being able to get through. <laughs> so yeah, open it up. Do you want to? Yeah. So that's kind of the formative pruning and the basic steps. And we go around where well, we've got those kind of stuff there. We kind of go around and do that on all these ones around the outside to keep encouraging it out. So. Yeah, this one's a little bit short and doesn't have ones. If you imagine an apple falling on the end of there, it can get a lot of weight. So it just shortens some and strengthens it. But we won't do that all now. No. We'll move on. Yeah. Come back and look at those at the end. So we've got our, so that's our new orchard that's been set up in the last couple of years. We've then got our more established orchard around this side. We've done a bit of clearing, it was a bit overgrown because obviously we've not been running we've not been running activities for the last year, which means that things aren't quite in as quite as well maintained as they normally might be. So please forgive us for the state of our orchard. One thing another thing to say about this orchard is it is very closely planted. We'll talk a bit more about that later, but if you're looking at it thinking that's very closely planted, we know we're working on resolving it. But I think it's something that's very easy to, to not realise at the point you're planting it. Mm. When things are the size of the ones that they are there, it's easy, even if you're planting it, to yeah. not quite realise how much space you need. And and so I... the edge of the path here is in clearly there, and very clearly this apple tree is growing into the path. So you're either going to need to prune it to manage that, or step it further away, or a bit of both. I think a lot of in a lot of sort of gardening, like when they're talking about planting distances, when you plant your cabbages, they say put it seven, whatever it is, it's 70 centimetres of cabbage. But I can't remember the planting distances off the top of my head. But they say it's like 70 centimetres. And you're like, oh, well, I can get away. I've only got like a 120 wide bed, so I think I can get away with three. It's kind of true with cabbages. When it comes to trees, when it says 8 to 12 foot for a dwarf rooting stock, you want to be generous with that. The temptation to just sort of slightly come under the 8 foot recommended planting distance which is what's happened here like i don't think that's six foot but it's meant to be minimum it's minimum eight foot and that really does matter because the tree will grow it will get big and you'll get the overcrowding problems that we're going to have a little bit of a look at later but yeah we were saying this is actually quite a good example of a tree that has been formatively pruned it's got this sort of shape coming into itself so we're now just doing a maintenance prune on this one so that Whereas, bit there is the bottom of the wine glass. So you kind of like the size of the wine glass. Sometimes yeah. you get a very much like the actual wine glass shape. Sometimes the tree just a more angular way. Yeah. And this is, but that's the, the lead has been cut out there. Same as what we've done there. And we've got our structure. So yeah, that was sort of more formative pruning we were doing on the young trees. And this is maintaining this one. So initially we're looking for sort of, some people say 3D, some people say 4D which is dead, dying, damaged, or diseased. Also, the sort of water shoots that Toby was talking about, front and crossover, so ones that are coming back into the middle or ones that are crossing another branch or another tree or this black current here down in the middle. You can kind of see there's lots of the crossing going on at different places. So that's an example of crossing. That's part of what I was talking about earlier with um, the time of year. So if you've got two branches that are crossing and they're rubbing, that's going to damage the bark, that's going to damage the trees, that's going to let infection in. So that's the sort of cut, that sort of light touch pruning I would do at the start of winter, because winter is when you get all of the storms, you get the wind, and that rubbing is going to be much worse. So if you do it at the end of winter, you're going to be letting all of that damage happen through the worst months. So you're better off removing that damage potential. And also, so yeah, this is an example of damage. So this tree, this branch here is actually no longer attached. That's not going to get better. So you want to take it back. Thank you. Take it back to a point where the sap can rise. There is a bud there, but I probably wouldn't go with that as Toby said it's coming out over the path 
I would probably take, so you want to take it back to the place where the joint, so when I say where the sap can rise, there wants to be a place that can keep growing. If you cut it here, it's going to do that thing with the nub where that just dies back. That's not going to, that's not going to send out. It might send out some like panicked shoots. We'll have another look at something where that happens, but it's not going to, yeah, it's not going to grow from, maybe from that bit, probably not. Take it back to where there's a major um, stem for it to go down. So this, that's too thick for the secretaires. Like, it's too woody. You want to come to the loppers. It's narrower than your thumb, so you can use the loppers on it. Go to the point where the branches and just take. So even though the damage is up there, we're taking it all the way back to this point. There we go, try and get a clean cut. And then, yeah, so that's a damaged one. I don't think we've got anything dead. So we've kind of got something dying. So if you look here, that's kind of dying back there. Yeah, it's nice to stay here. This one wasn't looking very healthy, but it's not dead yet. Yeah, see if we get a better shot of that one. So it's kind of dying. So we'll sort of, we'll take that dying end off. So I'll do that with the second edge, so that one's a bit narrower. Oh, I lost it. Sorry. So I'll take that one back to there. It's a small enough branch, but that's what suits comparable. Um, on this side, I've got a couple of examples of one of the again. <laughs> We're okay. Alex, Alex, okay. So we've got a damaged one here where you see it did snatch in the past. There's a wound there, so I'm going to cut that one off. But I'm also going to take off this one where it's growing down. It's crossing under one. You can see it's definitely going to rub there, and it's only going to keep doing that. Even if I trim this bit off, it's growing into the space where that branch is. Another thing to do when you look at that, so. The leaves and the fruit are quite heavy, so it's worth just, sort of, especially on these thinner branches, just giving them a sort of gentle yeah. spring, because when they're in full leaf, it'll pull it down and they'll actually be quite a bit lower sometimes, especially with yeah. the longer, thinner branches. They will drop down. So then, so this one, it's coming down anyway. This will drop down and it will probably rub on this one, especially as this one grows out. So again, coming to the so I'll take that one back. I'm going to take this one off. Yeah, I'm trying to leave a nice clean cut and I'm not trying to cut it right against the branch. I'm cutting it so it's that small circular wound and again it'll grow over there. So this is the so yeah we've done seed going and downwards, yeah, these guns that are sort of growing down. You want me to take that one off? I think so. These ones that are growing back into the middle, the, any little thin ones that are growing back into the centre, just want to take them right back. Yeah, take a few of them out. The ones that are sort of coming more out to the side, you might want to prune to sort of take it to add into the form. But the ones that are growing back into the middle, just completely remove. This one I might take quite low to try and bring it into this gap here. that one to take it out there because I've because because we've got these lower ones that are coming out onto the path but we kind of want to take them back and stop them from the path thinking about how we use the space as well as the fruit tree of trying to refill that space where I'm taking it out lower down so it will grow out above head height so that we've got the path yeah. still going Might take it where this is yeah. coming back and doubling back on itself. So it's one here that I was going to wait. So that one's sort of coming back. It's looping round the tree itself, and that's just going to sort of encase this branch. So this is where again we can. There's quite there's lots of cuts can do there's lots more we can do i think actually yeah this one works coming back into the middle yeah 
I'm like, could I take you back there and try and send it out there? But maybe you can take you back. What do you reckon? I'd say if you do have a second person who knows a bit about fruit tree food, yeah, I mean, it's definitely going into the terrain of this yeah. run. So you've got a, the, this branch of the goblet, but it's going across this exactly middle. Exactly that. And again, the middle space is actually quite open, but you've There's got this these one here and that's... these coming. So certainly these bits are coming, but I would be tempted. We haven't taken anything else big off this no, tree. So should we just take that bit off here? And then there's space for this one to sort of grow and develop, and that yeah. can sort of fill this side of the wine glass. Are you happy with that? Shall I do it? I think so, yeah. yeah. So this is a slightly bigger branch, so this needs to think a bit about how to cut it off carefully. You don't want to leave really big roots. Here is actually quite a good example of someone has they've tried to marry it up neatly with the, with the side of the branch, but as a result, they've left quite a big cut, maybe bigger than is ideal. But you could see why it's been done. I'm not going to try and do that. I'm not going to try and cut right along there. Should we gonna... demonstrate a proper a branch cut at this stage? Yeah, I can go. I think that might be worth doing. Cause... So, so I'll, I'll, I'll do it a bit higher, then I'll try and get it up there and there. Yeah, so that's what we were saying. You can't fix it. Because there's the weight at the end of the branch, when you do this part, it's much more likely, I mean, this isn't that big a branch, but it's the principle of it, and it's always worth just following the principle, I'd say. If you do a branch cut, you do it further out, then you can then, once the weight's off, you can then do a neat cut that will finish it off. So what Toby's done here, do you want to explain? So I've cut in about one third of the way in from below, um, to form basically to give the tree you can see now there's a space for it to move and then i'm going to cut in just above that not with the aim of hitting it but like to finish above it with the idea being that if the weight of the tree starts to pull it down you might actually pull it, to try and it won't tear all the way down here it will tear into that little cut and pull the little step this all goes to plan to pull it to try and what happens so this is what happens so naturally with the weight is, of Imagine I'm a heavy Not too much, though, but Freya is supplementing gravity. And it's just... Yeah. Go. So we've got our step. It's gone to try and tear, and it's torn into there and left a step. So that undercut also gets called a stop cut. It's... Yeah, it stops the tearing. Now, I'm not going to leave it like that. That was to deal with the weight. And now I'm going to go again, lower down, and just go through the in one. I'm going to aim just to go below that bit there. So again, not quite the shortest cut. I'm putting a bit of angle on it. I think it's a bit of a balance between leaving a small wound, but maybe not the smallest wound. And that is... Yeah. That demonstration about me and Toby talking it through, like we both know how to prune tree, we both know it's just useful to have someone to bounce off idea because there is multiple ways of doing it and like I don't know, I find it useful to be able to so, yeah, talk it through sometimes especially with ones, I mean that has opened it up, that is, that is a good part, that was definitely the right move. So I think we've covered those things from small ones to the bigger ones and talk about the human yeah. Anything else you want to cover? Um, I don't know. So we've got these black currants that are kind of growing up through the tree as well. So I don't know how much we'll go into how to prune them, but this is something where you think you do want air to be able to get around the stem of the plant. So we do really want to get that away from this. You want much more clearance than there really is. Same goes with this tree here. So this is a tree. For yeah, let's just do a quick run through of ones that haven't quite gone right. Yeah. So that's the one that's gone like that's the right shape. That's the, it's got the black current growing up through it. That's a bit of a problem. But other than that, the actual tree itself is healthy. But then if you look up here, there's this tree here, which is growing into the crown of that one. And we've got this here. But if you look down at this tree, so this is the tree we're looking at that's too close to that one. It's kind of got this kind of the base of the leader. It's been formatively pruned there. And these branches are quite nice. They come out the right way. But this one, 
if we were just looking at this as a standalone tree, we want to encourage branches to go out that way and make this goblet shape. But as you can see, even when it's not going that way, it's already going into the crown of that tree over there. And I mean, yeah, they're about six foot apart, that, and they should be at least eight. Min eight is the minimum for any apple tree planting distance. Eight foot. Um, so this tree, let me maybe go around that side. We're just going to really struggle to get it to be the right shape. And what's going to happen over time as it develops, so we stand back so you can see the shape of the tree. So as it develops, it's going to get heavier and heavier on that side. And it's going to grow up and there's not going to be the counterbalance there. So just as it grows, it's going to be pulling itself that way. It's going to, it's always going to be struggling. So I think what we really want to do with this is in the long run, or the fairly short run, not this year, but we want to look at trying to find a place to transplant it to. You can transplant trees this big. It's not ideal. Ideally, you want to plant them in the right place. But if you do, just very briefly, you do quite a hard prune if you're going to transplant them, get as much of the root ball as possible and take, but bring quite a lot of it harder than you would on a normal basis. And then do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, so this is an example of a tree that maybe hasn't had its leader cut out again it's a bit tricky because again it's quite close to here um so ideally you probably wanted to form the goblet around this height so to have been cut to here earlier and start to shape it if that was your plan to form that shape and um what's happened now is i think last year this section has been cut so now the the, the the straight growth has been reduced. This year we'll probably cut it again, either here or possibly even to here, depending on how bold we're feeling. <laughs> and um, yeah, and trying to over time reform that shape. It has the challenge again of being very close to this one, so it might never. Um, it might end up a little bit like the tree that Freya just been talking about, a little bit unbalanced. I think, and that's awesome. okay. If you look at the stem of this one, I don't know how much you can see it from the side you're on, Alex. It's leaning a lot that way. So this is another thing. This is sort of demonstrating the importance of staking your trees, but especially when they're young. So we've got those ones staked. Um, it's leaning. You want to prop it up. You, it, you want them to be growing upwards. So what we need to do is we need to put a stake in and we need to tie it around with something flexible so it's not damaging the bark. And, yeah prop it up to not because what will happen now is because the weight's leading that way over time it'll grow and it will sort of gradually get further and further over that way so yeah do you have more to say on this tree? no yeah, have there been any questions at all about it? no no a quick look at the sort of oh. things that so these are ones I've taken off my apple tree on my personal allotment I was pruning that this weekend so I just brought a few of the things that were of interest on it because it's a it my tree is a beautiful old tree it's massive and it's been really really beautifully maintained for a really long time apparently the gentleman that used to have well, had it for like 40 years and he did an amazing job of pruning it but then somebody took the plot out there's been sort of people taking the plot over who didn't know how to prune an apple tree so it's kind of an example of what happens if you do it wrong so this is kind of one where it's been cut. So this is where it was one of the big scaffolding branches and someone had obviously just been trying to get under the tree. So they just chopped the branch off where it was annoying them, but they didn't take it back to a proper point where the sap could rise. So what's happened is it's then not healed properly. It sent up loads of this sort of water growth where it's try been trying to go like, oh, I've been cut. I'm meant to be growing there. What's going on? It had loads of stuff coming. I mean, there was going down, it was coming out, it was all over the place. But it's also not healed properly then. Because it's yeah, just been trying to keep this bit alive rather than trying to heal itself. So the rots got in there. And there was a slightly less badly... Actually, I, I tell a lie, I actually took that bit. There was a one that had just been cut like hacked back like this last year. And I took that off last year, but it was already rotten. So the rot was still there. So what I've done this time is I've taken it further back i'm trying to save the branch because it's like it's a really lovely branch that it's sort of attached to but i may well have to now because this cut's been done badly one of the beautiful main structural branches of the apple tree i'm probably going to have to remove if this cut hasn't worked 
Um, you can also see, so this is on an older tree, there's these cracks, which that sort of infection getting into the tree and that will just get worse and worse. I don't know if you can, if you get right in close to that, you can see it goes through quite a lot of layers. And so branches that are diseased like that, you want to be kind of getting rid of the, the worst of them. This is actually an example of me going, me doing something wrong. So that branch cut that Toby just uh, uh, what? Uh, <laughs> so this is um, this was a branch. I was taking this branch off here, and I took this branch off here. I didn't do the stop. Uh, there was a, a little. There was something in the way, so I didn't do the stop cut properly. And what it's done is it kind of went in there, and you can kind of see it's torn down the bark. So that is. Oh, and I've cut my hand. That is where the bark is torn. So that's not going to heal properly. So instead of trying to remedy where I've gone wrong, I just did another cut, a proper cut, a, a neater cut, and took it back to the next point. Because otherwise, that's just going to get disease. That's just going to get infection. That's just going to rot this anyway. And it, in the process of letting it rot, it's much more likely to travel down past this point. So you're better off just removing that. You can also see there's this little whirl. Those are quite common on apple trees. They're not a disease. They're they're fine. They're they're sort of benign growths. They make you, people that do spoon carving. I know some people that will go out sort of look for ones like this of things that have been removed because they make quite nice patterns. But they're, they're on especially the sort of dwarfing rootstock trees. They're really common. They're just sort of a part of the genetics of something that's been heavily cultivated over a long time so don't worry about things like that but this branch has come off because it's got this tatty um cut this is not the best example of but this is an example of a cut that's sort of been done too far out and it's sort of you can see where the i don't know if you can see where the bark's sort of been trying to heal so this is one that's going all right if you look there the bark, it's not healed yet, but the bark's kind of coming out over the top and it's gradually closing over it. Whereas this one, on this side, I don't know if you, how well you can see it, but instead of growing, bulging up and around and over, it's kind of just peeling away. So it's growing, but it's growing out. And you can see it sort of, so down that side, it's peeling away. And then this side, it's just sort of rotting down and just ending up with this rotten nub. And again, there's all of this sort of growth coming outside. And if it's sending out kind of that much, then it's not. It's not liking it. So I've just taken that back to a better point where there's a place to sap the rise up another branch and that bit's just been taken back. So, we've not had any questions in the comments. Is there anything else you feel we need to cover? No. Hey, the only other thing I wanted to say is that underneath those upper trees, there's lots of black currants. If you are feeling the black currants this time of year, it's a great time of year to propagate. So you can cut bits off put them in the ground and grow new ones. Um, but we won't go into that right now. Brilliant. So that was a bit of a long one, but it is, I'd say, for learning how to prune an apple tree, actually that's quite a short amount of time. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of practice. It is worth if you're not confident going kind of working your way back on little cuts and seeing how it heals i think when you've done it a few times and you've kind of seen how it heals over time and seen how it changes the growth it all starts to sort of piece together to make sense so do try and remember where you cut come back and observe them and yeah getting into it, it's really it's part of the fascinating world of orchards and things like i i do love it and like really getting, getting to know apple trees and getting to understand how they work it's really worth doing but yeah a, an hour long tutorial on it is a sort of short introduction but alicia yeah. did say at the beginning that she was hoping that we could give her some information so hopefully that has helped um if not any questions again shoot them our way and we'll do our yeah, best like, we've done sort of quite a quick introduction and we've done some talking about restorative pruning but we've not been going into like in-depth restorative pruning um we we do know more information than we've given. So if you've got specific questions about the tree you've got at home, if you've got specific, a general question you feel we've not covered, please do get in touch. And yeah, we can try and answer them for you. 
Um, yeah, I think we wrap up. Yep. And then go warm up. <laughs> yeah. Mm, oh, good question. Alex is asking me to tell you what's next week, which we'll be putting a post up soon where you'll see what exciting live stream is next. We do have it planned, but I just can't remember the timetable off the top of my head. So we're actually, we're going to be focusing in the next few weeks on, because we did it last week with the stop tour through the different types of habitat books you've got, and the week before we did how to build a bird box. In the next few weeks, we're going to do a few more sort of how to make little habitat areas in your garden or whatever you've got at home. It doesn't have to, if you don't have a full garden, there's always little have things you can do to help wildlife. So in the next few weeks, we're going to be doing them. But I can't remember exactly what it might be wildlife pond. Like how to make a mini wildlife pond, it might be hedgehog box. I'll need to double check, but it will appear. We'll, I'll schedule the video soon, and that will appear on the Hollywood of the Scout Train Facebook and also on our channel. So, thank you very much to Toby for coming and helping today. No problem. That was an ex extra expert in the, in the mix. Thank you, Alex Kemba. Thank you to Hazel at the other end, and thanks everyone for joining us. And yeah, I'll see you next week. Toby, we'll see you again. Sometime. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you.